EG partnership report, fast tracking SDGs, driving Asia Pacific transformation. The theme report of the Asia Pacific Forum for Sustainable Development 2020, which is being held today, and which identifies how, at the start of a decade of action for sustainable development, we can fast track progress in Asia and the Pacific. I'm Paul Bunsell, I look after communications at the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, ESCA, and I'll be moderating today's session. But much more importantly, to introduce this report, I'm delighted we have with us representatives from all the organizations that have collaborated to prepare the report. Ms. Armida Salcia Alice Jabana, United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary of ESCAP. Mr. Bangbang Tusantano, Vice President for Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development of the Asian Development Bank. Ms. Valerie Clear for the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, Deputy Director for Asia and the Pacific and uh, Director of its Bangkok Regional Hub. And uh, to respond to the report, um, we're looking to look forward to welcome uh, Professor Sohel in uh, Ayatula at the inaugural UNESCO Chair, Professor at Tampang University, Associate uh, at Melbourne Business School, the University of Melbourne, and the MetaFuture School. And to complement our esteemed panel, and at the ready to provide more technical detail uh, on the report, let me also uh, welcome Ms. Katinka Weinberger, uh, Chief uh, of the Environment and uh, Protection here at ESCA. Uh, Ms. Uh, Smita Nakhuda, a Senior Results Management Specialist at the Asian Development Bank, and uh, Mr. Bishwa Gwari, UNDP Program Specialist. So the, the running order uh, of the session is, is as follows. The, the panelists will begin by providing an overview of the report's key findings, uh, and in Professor Sahel's case, uh, a response to the report before we move on to the Q&A session. You can ask your questions while the presentation is ongoing uh, through the YouTube channel, to which there are links uh, on the UN SCAP website. You can also send us a, an email uh, at escap-scab at un.org. And you can also follow us on Twitter at UNSCAP, uh, hashtag SDG Partners uh, AP. We'll collect your questions and put them to the panelists at the end of the introductory statements. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand over, uh, first of all, to the uh, Under Secretary General, Ms. Alisa, uh, Alice Jabana. Um, I'd like to hand over to you for an introductory presentation. And if I may, just kindly remind um, the other panelists at this stage to um, turn their videos off so that we have uh, Alice Jabana and her presentation uh, just for this part of the um, launch. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Paul for the introductory remarks. Uh, distinguished delegates, colleagues and friends, it is my pleasure to be here to launch and introduce the theme report for the Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development, which has been produced under the Asia Pacific SDG partnership with ADB, Asian Development Bank, in which uh, I also would like to welcome Vice President Bambang Susantono and UNDP, uh, in which I also would like to warmly welcome uh, Valerie Cliff. So uh, let me now uh, turn on my slide yet to again uh, show all of you the key highlights, the key highlights of uh, the report. So the report is on fast tracking the SDGs, driving Asia Pacific transformation. The report presents an analysis of Asia Pacific transformation. It draws strongly on country experience to make recommendation for moving forward. There is a strong case for accelerating transformation in our region. Why? Because ESCAP's progress report, which was launched in March of this year, shows that Asia-Pacific region is not on track to achieve any of the 17 SDGs by 2030. 
The Declaration of Global SDG Summit in September 2019 identifies six transformative entry points. These entry points help synergize implementation efforts. Mostly, SDG indicators are used to understand how quickly and how advanced the region is in harnessing this transformation, the six through the six entry points. It shows that economic growth needs to be more just and sustainable if we want to achieve SDGs. We have seen the impact in inequitable aspects of the hardship faced by COVID-19 took hold. This report analyzes progress in transformative entry points. Three questions are answered. How does each country's speed of progress and level of achievement compare with regional averages? So the countries in the top two quadrants, the so-called fast risers and the sprinters, are moving more quickly than the regional average. Second question is, what are the relationships between the entry points when we look at the country's track records? Third question is, what can we learn from some of the fastest moving countries? Especially, this would be very useful for other countries yet to emulate. Some key insights are gained through the study or the report, which is again, income is not a silver bullet, meaning it's not the major determining factor. Because we see some low income countries can move quickly, despite the unvariable starting positions that they have. Likewise, countries with special needs also show that they can progress quickly. In all transformative areas, there are countries that have progressed much faster than past performance would have predicted. So therefore, there is nothing deterministic about the possibility of change. This despite only gradual progress towards sustainable development goals. So therefore, yeah, this in itself is a source of optimism. Another insight is on policy coherence is an untapped opportunity. We found that there are strong synergies across entry points, the six entry points. For example, human well-being and capabilities, sustainable and just economies, as well as energy access and decarbonization are especially influ influential and they are mutually reinforcing. They, they potentially can mutually reinforce it. We did not find statistically significant trade-offs. This means that trade-offs are not inevitable and can be managed. For example, we expected to see trade-offs between progress on sustainable food production and healthy nutrition and protecting the environmental commons, given the typical modes of production in the region. Among some countries that are relatively high income and advanced, progress is more slower why? Because the countries face the so-called last mile challenges, leaving no one behind and dealing with complexity that needs innovation. The report also draws on the experiences of the countries that have moved ahead most quickly, that has uh, been successful in accelerating transformation. Yes, several countries' strategies are highlighted in the report and provide inspiration lessons learned. The report especially highlights actions that target transformation for those normally left behind, addressing sociocultural and financial barriers, partnerships and market and systems of service delivery, for example, which impact the poorest are all featured. The report also conclude with identifying four key building blocks for accelerating transformation based on country experiences and innovation also experiences. First, set direction and mobilize stakeholders and partnership. It means governments and stakeholders are inspired, energized, mobilized and able partners under a vision that unites and with clear policy direction. COVID-19 response and recovery plans must adopt mission orientation to SDGs. 
wage among others, for example, alignment of economic stimulus plans yeah, with the green, inclusive, and resilient recovery. Involve and partner with business, other stakeholders, communities, universities, and others yeah, to respond and recover better. Second is on the systemic alignment for transformation. We are as strong as our weakest and most vulnerable. We need to remove systemic barriers to social protection, healthcare, and education systems because gaps and discriminatory practice cause risk and precipitate loss of life. Effective, protect, effective social protection, resilient uh, health, food systems, and digital technology has no doubt saved lives in our region. Third, readying people and institutions to sustain change. We must invest in institutional resilience and transformative capacity. This is about agile, responsive civil service and mechanism for learning. Governments must provide room and opportunity to adapt and innovate. Key elements of these are digital transformation, effective local governor, governance, transparency and accountability, and a strengthened social contract that provides protective measures. How youth experience this period of disruption will shape the future. Youth are especially challenged by loss of learning, diminishing employment prospects. Mindsets and social values play an important role. And fourth and last is policy making for managing complexity a so-called revolution in the way policy is made. Policy-making approaches need to be fit for purpose in this fast-changing and complex policy landscape. Open policy-making that works with diverse information as inputs and applies system thinking can unlock agile and creative solutions and bring coherence to responses. For the COVID-19 response and recovery, we must invest in understanding what happened and why, and what it means for the future, what opportunities are provided by disruption. Final message is, again, we are increasingly facing this complexity in the policy landscape and a test of governance and commitment of leaving no one behind. Government capacity to direct and manage change will be critical for our ability to deliver SDGs. This report can help each country understand where it stands on the path to transformation. The report highlights opportunities for mission orientation towards 2030 agenda in the context of COVID-19 response as well as beyond. The four building blocks presented in the report and the six transformative entry points can frame recovery efforts that aim for systemic level change. And finally, again, I would like to uh, invite and urge participants to go to the portal, to the web of A Asia Pacific SDG partnership to read the full report and see other knowledge partnerships. I would like again to thank our partners ADB, Pak Bambang Susantono, UNDP, Valerie Clay for its work with us to prepare this report. Thank you and over to you, uh, Paul. Thank you very much, Under Secretary General, for a very uh, clear presentation. Um, if I think we can now move swiftly on uh, to uh, Vice President uh, Susan uh, Tono. Vice President, could I hand over to you for your um, opening remarks, please? Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Executive Secretary Ibu Armida Alisabana, and also my colleague uh, Valerie Cliff from UNDP, also Professor Sohail, and all the uh, participants of the sessions. Uh, first, of course, uh, thank you for the presentation, Executive Secretary Alisabana. It is my pleasure to join all of you in this unique uh, virtual launch of the 2020 SCAP EDB UNDP report on SDG. So, as many of uh, you know, ADB partnership with SCAP and UNDP is long standing. And I really appreciate these partnerships. 
Since 2002, we have collaborated to provide a regional perspective on global development agendas, first on the MDG, Millennium Development Goals, and now on the Sustainable Development Goals. The 2018 and 2019 reports prepared for the Asia-Pacific Forums and high-level political forum on SDGs highlighted the need for transformations to create sustainable, resilient, inclusive, and equitable societies. The COVID-19 has driven home the importance of these themes. We were already off track in achieving the SDGs, and measures to manage the pandemic have made this challenging situation even harder. In many of our debates on accelerating progress toward the SDG, we have recognized the important role that disruption can play in enabling transformations. We need to seize this opportunity to refocus our efforts to achieve the SDG. Each of the six entry points that has been de described for the transformative change explored in the report are influenced by COVID-19 while also promising effective responses to the pandemic. So let's, let us take one entry point as an example, energy decarbonization and access to energy. The report notes that this entry point is particularly challenging as it pulls policy choices in two potentially opposing directions. Too many countries in our region have increased access to energy without addressing emissions on promoting clean energy. Forcing our economies to contain the pandemic has resulted in some temporary reduction in air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. But going back to business as usual will put us back on a path to the climate change crisis. With oil at the sum of its lowest prices ever, countries may be tempted to opt to conventional fossil fuels for both energy and transport. The choice will further exacerbate the ongoing climate change crisis and undermine environmental sustainability. This will be particularly problematic in our region where there has been regressions rather than progressions against most environmental SDG. On the other hand, with countries' fiscal space increasingly constrained, this could be an opportunity to take a fresh look at the infrastructure regimes and reduce fiscal burdens associated with subsidies for fossil fuels. In past financial crisis, infrastructure investment has been an important part of recovery and stimulus package aimed at restarting economies. Infrastructure investment is also closely related to many of the other transformative entry points explored in the report, including urban and peri-urban development, human capabilities and well-being, and building sustainable food systems. It is worth recalling that stimulus package in response to the 2008 financial crisis help enable some of the renewable energy investments that the world has benefited from at over the past decade. We need to ensure that in tackling the challenges of SDGs today, we sustain the policy and investment support mechanism for clean and renewable energy that we have put in place over the past few years. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, for our part as MDB, it will be vital to support countries in these difficult choices we will need to ensure that our own finance support infrastructure that is green, resilient, and inclusive. We have been developing new metrics and standards within ADB to support this goal. Our targets to mainstream climate change mitigation and resilience in our operations, scale up climate finance, and to ensure that our investment aligned with the Paris Agreement on climate change have, ever, have never been more important. So we are faced with a new normal. Public and private resources are stretched worldwide we need to maximize the impact of every investment to save life and secure livelihoods under the SDGs. To do this, we have to build back together. Partnership has, all been, has always been the cornerstone of this endeavor of ours in ADB. We look forward to continuing our joint work with UNSCAP and UNDP to further analyze and explore the medium term effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the SDGs so that we can prepare for and re envision many possible different futures. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Vice President, for that clear overview of some of the challenges, but also uh, the opportunities that we uh, need to focus on uh, as we build back uh, following this pandemic. If I could now uh, turn to Ms. Valerie uh, Cliff for her uh, introductory remarks, please. Uh, Ms. Cliff, uh, over to you. 
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to be here with my colleagues from uh, ADB and SCAP and other guests on the occasion of the launch of the 2020 Asia Pacific SDG report, fast tracking the SDGs, driving Asia Pacific transformations. COVID-19 is having a devastating socioeconomic impact. It's having an even greater impact on those most vulnerable, women, elderly, youth, low-wage, informal workers, the disabled, and other vulnerable groups of developing countries who lack adequate social protection. To combat the challenges, the UN development system has been implementing a five-pillar framework for the socioeconomic recovery. We've yet to find a lasting solution to this devastating crisis, so we must continue to work together to address some of the wicked and complex development problems of our time, including the health pandemic and climate change. These problems are becoming more complex and are reaching a tipping point. We must recover and build back, or rather build forward better while accelerating the SDGs. Setting the direction and creating a sense of urgency, aligning systems and institutions, sustaining the momentum for change, and addressing policy trade-offs advanced by the regional report launched today are crucial for the transformation and recovery from COVID-19 and beyond. These actions, and in particular addressing some of those policy trade-offs, which maybe aren't such trade-offs, uh, require a systems thinking approach. This means looking into details of interactions and interdependencies among various elements of a system before reaching for solutions to systemic problems. Next Generation UNDP is trying to tackle the complex challenges of our time. We're creating new solutions, building collaboration platforms, and sparking new partnerships and instruments for development. These innovations are disrupting the way our organization thinks, invests, manages, and delivers so we can perform faster and better than ever to accelerate progress of the sustainable development goals. The achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development now hinges on how we address the COVID-19 crisis. The unprecedented crisis, as we saw, and as this report shows, can decelerate progress on the SDGs. But COVID-19 also provides an opportunity. The crisis has given rise to new areas of programming for a safer, greener, more inclusive, and smarter recovery. The SDG report also shows evidence of countries' abilities to bring about change in the six transformative entry points as presented by Ibo Armida. Recovery beyond COVID-19 requires a fundamental shift in development pathways. The UN Secretary General has proclaimed that recovery from the crisis must lead to a different kind of economy. Otherwise, new viruses could emerge in the future and make sustainable, make development unsustainable again. The SDGs provide a framework which calls for maintaining sustainability on all three dimensions, environmental, social, and economic. And that's why it's really our framework to use. In fact, the sustainability of our social and economic system hinges on the sustainability of uh, natural systems. Ensuring the sustainability of the planet and prosperity of people requires strategic innovation, developing new skills and methodologies for integrated responses, fostering green and blue economies, preventing economic and social exclusion, promoting digital space and tolerance, undertaking environment and climate action, and addressing governance challenges for the future. Engaging in discussions on the annual high-level political forum theme is critical. Towards this end, the preparation of this annual thematic report, which UNDP is privileged to work with our partners in SCAP and ADB, is necessary and helpful to trigger that discussion. We look forward very much to continuing this partnership and serving countries and supporting them in accelerating the delivery of the SDGs. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Cliff. And uh, I think that's a, a great overview of some of those areas we all want to work together to focus on. So now, uh, could I uh, hand over to Professor Sahel to provide us a, uh, a response um, to uh, this report? Uh, Professor, uh, are you with us? And could I ask you to turn on your uh, camera if you are? Video and camera both on. All good? Back. Over to you. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, I just love the previous responses. Certainly um, love the report. Remember 20, I think 30 years ago, I was working with the justice system in the U.S. And every time we would do a report, it would disappear into someone's desk. I wrote a piece called The Politics of the Dusty Plan. And then when I read this report, I was marveled at it. And I thought, why does this one work so well? And I think it works well because it's data oriented, but it tells a story. So the quant people will love it. And the data, and then the story people will love it, and there's some ways forward. So I'm very appreciative of what you folks have done. So I think, and the aspirants, last milers, fast risers, and sprinters, they really set this up well. Here's a direction we're going in, and how do we keep track of everyone? So the only thing I wanted to add on to this would, okay, the part we add in our futures work is, okay, here's the vision. You set up the narrative. What are the alternatives then? So I would just bring in some scenario work that we do. So I've been running scenario workshops on COVID-19 in the last two months. I think we've read through a thousand articles, or at least a few hundred articles. And really four futures keep on coming up. And see this as not true or false, but since there's unknowns there, where will we actually go? So future one is very much called the zombie apocalypse. Meaning fear everywhere, markets are crashing, nations breaking up, and everyone's trying to figure out who are the zombies, who are the ones we're afraid of, who are the ones we avoid. We know domestic violence is going up. That's the zombie phenomenon. There's this anger rising. So in this scenario, the sprinters make it, but the last milers, the other ones, the aspirants, they all get eaten by the zombies. Society is actually fractured. So this is really will be going backwards. We need a strategy for that. I was working with a school two days ago. I said, aha, this is a real scenario. In this scenario, what will we tell all the parents? I said, you can trust our school. We will protect the person at the end. The weakest will ensure our school protects them. So we're developing a national strategy for that. Scenario two is kind of where we are now. The hammer in the dance, what I call the great pause, then we speed up. So everyone's moved online, we're meditating more, pollution's disappearing, everyone's slowing down, but there's an itch, let's get back to business. And everyone's saying, well, business means, well, the CEOs are saying, business as usual, let's just back to what we were doing two months ago. And some people are saying, well, we're not sure we wanna go back to business as usual. So business as usual, there's a vaccine, there's a cure, or you know, there's green zones where we're allowed to travel. We just forget that we have this, six months off or nine months off, just go back to how we did everything. And there's some disquiet there, but what would business usual look like? Most people are expecting that. And that may be the case, I don't know, we do scenarios. Scenario three is to me more interesting. This is the pause not to return, but to transform. So in scenario three, I would call this the great health awakening. COVID-19, not as an enemy, but COVID-19 is a portal. A portal to where becomes the question. So what do we really want to keep with us? Again, at the school system, I said, well, we actually like a lot of the online stuff, but we miss the connection. So let's create a new model for our school called the hybrid model. And the metaphor they kept on saying is let's get flexible. It was a take on that 1980s song, let's get physical. Let's get flexible. So we build in total flexibility to everything we're doing. So this moves to not... We pause to go back to business as usual. We pause to transform how we're doing everything. This is enabling AI, enabling virtuality, enabling gender equity. We feel like what's worked really well and we get back to work, we actually do things differently. So in this scenario, meeting the SDGs is much quicker because everyone's enabled. This you might call the great health awakening, the 4P, uh, prevention, personalized, partnership and participation, we know when you have those four health outcomes are much stronger. But this is this transformed one. Now scenario four is the tougher one. 
He says, there's no vaccine, there's no cure. We're just in the first wave, maybe over in the developed and progressive countries. We know the weaker countries, Sweden, US, UK, they're, you know, they're still in the tough part, but other countries have moved on. Now we're worried about wave two, wave three. So this I call the great despair. We actually don't find a solution. And this is the seven year recession when people actually give up. So basically Aspen say SDGs are too hard. We can't do this. So I'm suggesting here, the sprinters take a water break. They've been running fast to take a water break and then they give up. So this is pretty much everyone almost gives up on SDGs and gives up on their own life story. So this is suggesting the report is brilliant, what we're doing is brilliant, but let's try to see this as four different futures and this develops the robustness so we can plan and be ready for any future. And of course, these scenarios will be disrupted. In the earlier time in the morning, I talked about here are some of the disruptions. I'm going to skip those, but really start to see this. Let's be ready for any scenario. Let's use the current situation. In my view, here's a chance for a portal. Let's see if we make it. Thanks so much. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Professor Zohel, for making that case for, for transformation and building uh, resilience. So now um, I think it's time to move to the Q&A uh, uh, session. Could I kindly ask um, all four uh, principal panelists to turn their uh, videos on, please, for the questions? And uh, I have a question. Uh, so, sorry. Um, can, just a reminder, colleagues watching, um, you can ask questions either on the YouTube uh, feed or uh, by writing to us at um, scap-scas um, uh, at un.org. That's scap, E-S-C-A-P hyphen scas, S-C-A-P at un.org. Uh, Thank you all very much for your introductory remarks. And, I'm going to start off um, with a question. I have a question coming in from um, Phoenix TV from uh, Ms. Uh, Yuan Yuan. And uh, Ms. Yuan Yuan would like to know, um, how can we face the new normal um, in future economic and uh, a future economic and sustainable, um, sorry, the new normal in future economic and social sustainable development? How can, we, how can we move on uh, and face the new normal in, uh, in the areas of social and economic uh, sustainable development? And uh, she's asking whether ESCA and uh, our executive section any suggestions uh, for our member states. How can we face the new normal and build back better? Over to you, uh, Executive Secretary. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I think this also question overlaps yeah, with Professor uh, what what Professor Suhail just elaborated. Yeah, the the four scenario, which is very interesting. Uh, but again, I think yeah, going forward there will be this um, mix mix yeah, not quite one or the other. Because again, why? Because uh, countries are different, and and uh, within countries also there are differences differences yeah. Uh, but uh, again, the, the, the changes uh, that we started to see are more or less uh, some, some uh, convergence, yeah? uh, also to answer the question. One is change in behavior, people, consumer, also production, yeah, because it's breakdown value chain and so on. Uh, work, work behavior, work habit, education, uh, health and lifestyle yeah, in general, in general. Second is again, uh, I, I, I see it almost in all conversation, yeah, which is the role of digital technology. And for sure, for sure, our region, our region is, is big on this. Our region is big on this digital te technology. But at, this, at the other side of the coin, we have this digital divide. Yeah? So if we want to harness leverage yeah, uh, to benefit yeah. on this big, yeah, uh, big uh, benefit of digital technology, then we need by way of pri priority, we need to to tackle this digital divide. So investment, physical infrastructure uh, for this digital divide, but also uh, not not less not least important is uh, investment in the soft infrastructure because you you need to make the shift. 
yeah, the teacher, how how you 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 teach, yeah, online and that kind. Not of course infrastructure, but also yeah, the mindset and so on. So I think uh, these are yeah, the these are the critical elements. Of course, many yeah, but I think if if uh, government or stakeholders can can uh, prioritize on that yeah, then we can also uh, take uh, forward the SDGs because the implication rem ramification is to all sectors. Over to you, uh, uh, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ibu Amida. Maybe uh, Professor Sahel would like to add something as that indeed touches on some of the remarks that he gave um, just now. For me, it's, it's the new normal is not clear. Exactly as as secretary were saying, the new normal depends. It's different on any future. None of us. I mean, I don't know anyone who knows what's going to happen in five years. And if they say do, if they say they do, they're nutcases. And we're in a period of real unknowns, uncertainties, and we navigate by listening to the weak signals and figuring it out. So there's different normals. There's not one any clear new normal. So what I would ask the question: What does she mean by that? Or what does he mean by that? Thank you. Well, maybe uh, she can come in and uh, and give us a clarification on the YouTube feed. But while we wait for her to do so, I have a question coming in from a UN colleague for uh, the vice president. Um, and the question is, you've mentioned the importance of future thinking and foresight. Can you share a bit more about how this work can help countries respond to this pandemic and prepare for future shocks? Uh, Vice President, could, could I hand over to you for that question? Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a bit uh, audio connections problem. So can I? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Thank you, Vice President. Yes. Okay. So I think that uh, we had uh, in ADB programs with the Future and Foresight together with Dr. Inayatula, and uh, we did a couple of them in many countries. Uh, what we are trying to have is that the various scenario that we can build, yeah? uh, not only because of the, this COVID, but also because the dynamic conditions. Uh, for me, new normal is a dynamic, it's not a static conditions. Uh, before the crisis of COVID, for example, we are talking about the disruption of technology, right? Yeah, the uh, revolution, industrial revolution 4.0, that all the aspects of our life will be different because of uh, digital disruption. There will be IT, there will be AI, there will be robotic, there will be uh, big data, for example. Uh, and then also because of the climate change uh, uh, issues that now is becoming more and more uh, you know, visible for all of us. Uh, also another factor for the new of it is that uh, more of most of our people in Asia Pacific will live in uh, urban cities. So it will be the urban era society and also the aging society. We have uh, COVID-19, now we have to think how do we deal with this? Because uh, the new normal will be uh, the new normal after COVID, but before the vaccine will be uh, found, will be different with the new normal after COVID uh, vaccine will be found. Right? So uh, uh, future for working with the uh, data to, to uh, capture, trying to balance short-term measures and the long-term measures. We have to stay on the track. That's why we have to see that the future will be still there. But the way that we maneuver to uh, try to address the problems uh, now in many developing countries, for example, has delivering uh, the food. And there is a you know a joke that if people hungry, they will be angry. So there will be a social unrest, for, for example. So how do we uh, take the measure for the short term will be as important as the uh, medium and long term one. So we have to balance that one. And with the tools that we have uh, under the Trinaya uh, uh, future uh, foresight workshop, we can develop that kind of scenario. So for us in ADP, that is uh, the entry point of how we will assist our developing member countries in dealing with the various conditions. Back to you, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Can I look to see whether any of the other panelists want to add anything to that? If not, if not, I will move on. I've got another question from a 
uh, from the UN family coming here, and it's addressed to uh, Miss Cliff at UNDP. Uh, you've mentioned that the next uh, that the next generation UNDP is trying to tackle complex challenges, creating new solutions, building collaborating collaboration platforms and new partnerships and instruments for development. Can you share a bit more about how uh, they're helping countries respond to these complex challenges and accelerating the SDGs? So essentially, can you tell us a little bit more about how what you're doing is uh, helping countries uh, accelerate their progress towards the SDGs? Uh, over to you. Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, uh, today's challenges are indeed both complex and integrated, um, but so are uh, the SDGs. Uh, both require a system approach and an integrated response. Uh, building on uh, UNDP's uh, worldwide presence, our network, uh, we call it our global policy network with uh, 17,000 uh, persons participating in that and country platforms in 50 countries around the world. The next gen UNDP is um, looking at integrated solutions to accelerate progress. We also have an innovation center and 60 country accelerator labs that have been employing a systems approach for understanding the complexity of socioeconomic and environmental issues in areas such as natural resources management, plastics, uh, pollution, uh, youth employment, future of work and water access. Maybe I'll give just uh, two, two examples of, of how we're doing this on the ground, what we, what we think of as a systems approach. In India, uh, UNDP together with Gavi uh, is supporting the government of India's universal immunization program through designing an electronic vaccine intelligence network. It's called EVIN. Uh, it's an innovation that brings together technology, people, and processes to strengthen the vaccine supply chain by digitizing information on vaccine stocks and storage temperatures in 27,000 vaccine storage centers across all districts of the 29 states and seven union territories. Um, the storage centers, of course, can now also be used to store safely a COVID vaccine in the future that we're all hoping for. Uh, this program has recently been replicated in uh, Indonesia, for example. Uh, I'll give another example in, uh, in the Pacific. Uh, under the Parliamentary Effectiveness Initiative, UNDP is enhancing uh, the effectiveness and capacity of national parliaments through promoting participatory and transparent national planning processes, outreach, and citizen participation. Uh, including that and, and prioritizing that of, of marginalized groups. Uh, so I'll stop there. There's many other examples that are um, outlined in the report uh, and be happy to have people be able to read about it. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, I have a uh, another question coming in here from uh, Vanita Suneja, who works for uh, WaterAid. And uh, this question reads as follows. For low carbon green economy, where do we see the role of resilience at the local level with decentralized uh, governance on preventative health focused on water sanit sanitation, food, hygiene and biodiversity? So um, I I'll repeat that one more. If we're building a low carbon, green economy, uh, how do we see the role of resilience at the local level with decentralized governance, strengthening um, water, sanitation, food, hygiene and, and biodiversity uh, issues? Um, maybe I could turn to Professor Sohel to comment on that as we were talking about robustness earlier on uh, before seeing whether any of my other panelists would like to, to comment. It sounds great. I mean, that's what you wanted to do, right? Uh, you want to set up these global platforms, whether it's platform cooperatives or other systems where people could match, and then you want local access to see is the water green, is it accessible, is, is, is solar energy easy available? 
So you want to have as much peer-to-peer -peer local platforms set up locally around the Asia Pacific. And the role of SDGs, the role of governance is to make sure they're interoperable, they can, information can be shared. So when we were working with uh, mental health groups, the issue kept on coming up. We know suicide is increasing. Why can't we stop it? It was very clear because there's no data sharing between law enforcement, between mental health experts, between people who, who are have lived experience. So it, the metaphor they use is a world of roadblocks. So the better national strategy was actually creating the data tree so you have shared information among different groups. In this case, if we go to this 4P health revolution and awakening, then again, we're doing the same thing. We're finding ways to share the data, whether it's on water, on energy, on suicide, in ways that different people can help in real time at local levels. The global part is, of course, setting those rules up so it's shared. So I think what that person is saying is definitely on the right track, definitely what we want. It's creating the narrative and the AI and the local infrastructure for that. So that's where the organizations, whether UNDP, SCAP can help most or ADB. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I have another question just landed here from uh, Helal Udin, who says um, the COVID pandemic brought some learnings. Um, and one of those is that it does not discriminate uh, in who it hits, and it needs a, a united effort uh, from all of us together. Um, for the SDG 2030 agenda, this, uh, this uh, questioner, Helal, says it's the same thing. But um, how can we um, accelerate both our response to COVID-19 and uh, accelerate progress towards the 2030 agenda? Um, as a uh, on a taking a united front against uh, against both the pandemic and to accelerate progress, how can we build this united front? Uh, I'm going to uh, start with my executive secretary uh, Ibu Amida. How can we better uh, work together? I think the proof that you are all here is uh, is you know a good indication that we are working together. But Ibu Amida, would you like to to respond to that? Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Can I go back? Uh, a little bit yeah to the previous question I, I i want to make an important point yeah uh, because you know this water sanitation uh, hygiene food and 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 so on yeah uh, again yeah uh, one or uh, only one point very important that we we also take the so called demand demand responsive approach so not not only supply driven yeah, because uh, I understand, yeah, the government and then, you know, immediately the reaction is, okay, supply driven, yeah, just build, 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 and then without properly, you know, uh, taking participation ownership of the community of household, yeah, so very important, the so-called demand responsive approach, yeah, so so I, I just I just want to, to jump in on, on that point. And uh, uh, to go back to your uh, uh, question, is again how how we can have this united front but first the substance first yeah uh, because this covid 19 yeah this this health so basically yeah we need to find solution for the health because without this yeah th this will be going on and then uh, i know uh, any scenario yeah that professor suhail you know already envisioned can be any direction we don't know yeah so i think first and foremost is the health and even the health, then, then, then you have to have this united front. Yeah. So we, 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 we see that uh, uh, countries have have different different uh, success. Yeah. Because of different approach, because they are not that united and 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 so on. And and second, uh, simultaneously, also how how to mitigate yeah the impact right, uh, especially to to the most vulnerable. Yeah, so this is where the government has to come in. But again, our region, yeah, I, I would like to appeal, yeah, uh, let let us not to forget, yeah, because we have also the so-called informal informal social security system. Yeah, of course, the formal is government government, yeah, but come on, uh, 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 we have that in in Indonesia, yeah, Pak Bambang uh, Susantono knows, yeah, Gotong Royong, right, and all this, you know, self help and and uh, this compassion, yeah. Uh, helping neighbors, helping family. So why don't we we reactivate that? Yeah, 
because I, I don't think uh, I don't think government can can handle this yeah the the scale of this. And third is of course government and with with the various uh, stakeholders uh, that can uh, chip in. But again, I see yeah, I see that uh, the opportunity. Uh, I'm sorry to say again yeah this this digital technology yeah. But not not for the digital technology per se. But why don't you use it also to tackle poverty, to create new employment? But then you need to shift, yeah, to migrate. For example, SME. How can we then equip SME to quickly also be able migrate, so that they can also to uh, be able to use this digital platform? For example, yeah. Okay, so. That's uh, several of my suggestions. Over to you, Bob. Thank you. Well, I think I'm going to, I've got another question coming in from Roop Sunar, and so I think I'm going to move on to that one. I think it touches on similar issues. There's, he says that COVID-19 has uh, impacted all of us, but it has hit hard the socially excluded groups and communities, which I think refers a little bit to what you were saying just now, uh, Executive Secretary. What could be the strategies to help them face the new normal in the post COVID-19 scenario? So how can we help those groups most? And I think that is, it touches a little bit on what you were talking about just then, Executive Secretary. But if I could turn to uh, Ms. Cliff for, for her views on this, but also I'd be interested to hear the, the Vice President's uh, afterwards. Uh, Ms. Cliff, uh, over to you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so it is um, exactly what the you know, the underpinning of the SDGs is about leaving no one behind, uh, about uh, reaching those who are farthest behind uh, first. Uh, and and that's really what we have to do, um, whether it's through uh, universal basic income pilots, uh, whether it's through social protection uh, systems for those who are the, you know, th those who are not just, uh, it comes back to the report, it's not just those who are poor income wise, uh, it's those who are poor in, in other dimensions as well, those who are marginalized, those who, um, you know, women, um, those who suffer from, uh, unfortunately, uh, domestic abuse. Um, that's um, prevalent now, and, and it's really trying to get uh, social protection schemes to those people who are the most marginalized and trying to really uh, look at a vulnerability um, assessment. Who are the most vulnerable? Of course, people who lack uh, income, um, but there's other people as well in society who lack uh, opportunities and choices and their voice being heard and uh, those who lack human rights. Um, so it's really trying to set up our system so that we can identify, first of all, who are the most marginalized and in which dimensions, and then try to make sure that we, um, we err on the side of inclusive uh, rather than exclusive um, social protection schemes. Thank you. Thank you. Vice President, would you like to, to add to that from, from your perspective? Uh, I'm sorry, I have a connection problem, so I missed that one. But can I use this uh, opportunity to have two points? Uh, following up, yes, I'm following up of uh, Ibu Armida points. Number one is on the demand responsive. I think that is very important one. Uh, but uh, I would like also to add the institutional capacity because uh, you will be relying on that one in trying to execute the program. And that goes also to other questions on how we can have a more uh, better local uh, programs on SDG, for example. That is also need a lot of uh, uh, institutional capacity building. And uh, for us in ADB, that the local champ very important. Because if we don't have that one, it is impossible for the local government also to try to synergize or to try to coordinate with the national level. So the localization of SDG, for example, that is very important. And that has to come with, uh, with enough uh, capacity uh, in, in the local level, as well as there is a, 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 a champion or leader, for example, a good mayor or a good bupati in Indonesia or a good re regents or a good governor, for example. Yeah. 
And uh, another point is on the social cohesiveness. Uh, Ibu Armida also mentioned it's about the social value. And this COVID is really a little bit has some paradox. On one side, we have to do the physical distance. That means that your social cohesion is not going to be as strengthened as before. But now we have a media that can be plus or minus. It depends on the uh, uh, content of the media itself. So this is something that uh, new for us. Uh, in the future, we will see which one that uh, we will go. Uh, in the uh, transport, for example, uh, the public transport, we will see that the physical distance is really make you uh, have some, you know, space between you and others. But on the other hand, we, we have to keep our social cohesiveness so that, for example, the cities will still livable and the city, city still have a soul of the uh, people, uh, the citizens of the, the, the city itself, so that we can interact in a good condition and better conditions. Back to you, Paul. Thank you very much. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have uh, time for today. Can I really thank all the panelists for their interventions and lively responses to those questions that came into us live? Um, if we've been unable to get to your questions, if, if I didn't quite, we didn't quite have time, you can always send them to us uh, via email and we'll try and get back to you on them. Uh, questions on the report, it's uh, the address, let me repeat it one last time, is scap scas at un.org, um, or you can tweet us, or you can still uh, put it in this uh, YouTube uh, chat. But for now, can I hand over uh, to the panelists to say uh, goodbye before we bring this launch uh, to a close, thanking all the panelists once again and all of you for watching it. Thank you, Paul, for moderating also. You are a good moderator. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Professor Suhail. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. See you. Minggu depan.